Hello. In this video, we will look at the Northern and Italian early Renaissance in art and culture. Now, as the Gothic period started to uh, wane, started to evolve, um, we start to see the beginnings of the rebirth of classicism. Renaissance is a French word that literally means rebirth, and what's being reborn is the classical approach to art and culture. Classicism, remember, comes from the Greeks, and it basically says that uh, it's a more humanistic approach. It's a more orderly approach towards uh, perfection, towards the evolution of style. And what's happening in the early Renaissance is that there's a, a new spirit of both innovation and exploration and creativity um, and aesthetic. So the goal of Renaissance art is similar to the goal of classical Greek art, which is to find beauty and perfection. But the difference is that in the early Renaissance, we're going to see a focus on painting um, as the predominant art form and some of the advances of painting. And then some other new, the innovation of other new media like printmaking, uh, that will become very important, and the use of oil paint that, that uh, really changes art forever. So as we look at, uh, the, we move into the early Renaissance, there's also uh, a change in the, the social structure, the, uh, especially in Italy, but, but really all throughout Europe. We see the rise of What's, called, what's known as the ducal system. So instead of having um, only a, uh, a city by city leadership, there, there's still that, that the dukes, there's, there's dukes within each city who run the city and they, they feel uh, kind of an autonomy. But then there's also the monarchy. So at this point, this is really the beginnings of the, the high points of the major monarchies of Europe that we're used to thinking of and seeing. And the kings, they are, um, you know, they run the, the countries as we know them, but the dukes run the cities. And so it, within each city, that, the, the, that leadership and what the focus of that leadership and the character and identity of that leadership, that's really going to affect and to, um, give a, a, a freedom, an artistic freedom, in certain cities where those dukes really do embrace this classical, uh, return to a classical approach. So specifically in uh, Belgium, which is a, a, a new art center because of the rise of uh, the the rise of the, um, the wealth there centered around the East India Trading Company and some of the other uh, shipping companies that become very important there. Uh, also in Paris, which had, through the Gothic, become a cultural center. Uh, and then in, in places in Italy, like Florence, which was rising during the Gothic, but really comes into its own during the Renaissance. Um, they're rivaling Rome for the leadership of culture throughout Europe. Uh, and it's a, a continuation of the importance of religion as a subject matter and a theme. But we're going to start to see secular art become more important again. And then the, the rise again of uh, Greek classical subject matter. Uh, mythology finds its way back in. And the church is not, uh, not, not very much in favor of these subject matters. And so as such, they, uh, they really do try and uh, respond in a way and, and push artists towards, back towards uh, religious themes. Now, one of the other differences with the Renaissance, an important one, is that we know many more of the artists. And there's, there's a couple of major reasons why. First, uh, artists... And their relationship with patrons changes a little bit. What we see during the, the Renaissance is that the artists are going to, um, they're no longer going to just simply 
be executing the vision of a patron. They are now interpreting that vision in a variety of ways to um, to really express themselves creatively and to uh, um, and to try and um, put their own um, their own creative feelings and their own expression into their works. And so that's a change because previously art had really been focused on just expressing the doctrine of the church or supporting the propaganda and politics of the state. So now we're going to start to see artists feel a little bit more creative freedom. And another reason why we know so many more artists' names is that there's a concerted effort to tell their stories. This is the beginnings of the, the uh, division between um, art as seen only for the elite and nobility and art that is really more for everyone. It's a, a more popular view of art. And so um, especially printmaking addresses that. Printmaking allows for many more copies and prints to be made from a single plate and etching a, simple, a single image. And so that makes it more accessible because the cost per image comes down a little bit. And so instead of it just solely being for being the, the purview of the wealthy, now we're going to start to see art be accessible to uh, other um, levels of society. Now, in... Uh, in the north, in Burgundy and Flanders, um, there are several artists who are experimenting with a new medium. Uh, it's oil paint. Now, oil paint is a more complicated process than the painting materials and media that we'd seen before. Oil paint is... Um, involves mixing pigments, grinding the pigments to create the different colors, blending those pigments with binders, and then uh, using different varieties of oils, um, all natural oils, of course, uh, from linseed and flaxseed and cottonseed and grapeseed and other natural seed oils um, in various levels and combinations as a vehicle to mix together uh, and to uh, create the paint. Now, the the oil paint is um, very different than the other forms of paint that we've seen artists use because it allows for much thinner layers, and those layers can take on different transparency depending upon how much oil that you use. And as you um, put layer upon layer on the surface, what you end up with is a, um, a painting that will have more of a luminescent quality to it. Now, um, Jan van Eyck and his brother Hubert van Eyck are very often credited with the invention of oil paint. However, there are several artists who are working on uh, their own formulas for oil paint um, during this time period. And so whether they were the first to invent it uh, or not, we're, we're not completely sure, but we do know that the Ghent altarpiece that you see here is credited as being the first large-scale, uh, high-quality oil painting in existence. Now, an altarpiece is a form that uh, is, is in itself relatively new to the early Renaissance. Um, remember that as Gothic churches emerged, um, there were still other churches that had that were traditional and had been there for a long time, Romanesque churches. And many of these churches, especially Romanesque, were not very decorative on the inside. And so uh, through the early Renaissance, there was a movement to add decorative elements inside many of these older, larger churches and cathedrals. And so this... Uh, altar pieces like this were a way to add a decorative element. They were paneled, made from wooden panels. Uh, they could be opened and closed to show various, and we'll see this one open and closed, uh, various scenes uh, depending upon the season. And then they were placed in these niches, in these ch side chapel niches behind altars. Um, where uh, in the past, in the medieval and Rom Romanesque period, you might have seen 
uh, relics or sculpture on display in these chapels. So these were placed behind those altars. And so this was a way to add a decorative element to what had been a pretty austere decorate, decoration style before from the Romanesque. Now, the Ghent altarpiece, this is the altarpiece closed, and we see here a, a, an image of the Annunciation. So this would have been a, the typical view of the altarpiece during the Advent season, just before Christmas and celebration of the Nativity. Um, now, and then it, during other parts of the times of the year, it would be open. Now, these, this uh, is oil paint on wood. These are wooden panels inside a wooden frame. Uh, the panels can be removed for, uh, for moving around, moving the altarpiece. Um, now, what's, what's remarkable about this altarpiece, this painting, and this style is that it allowed the artist to have a lot more realism. The, the modeling, the light and dark, putting so many layer, layer upon layer of paint uh, on the surface, that that really changed the way that um, artists worked. Uh, it's, uh, it's more subtle. Um, it creates a, uh, a more believable and realistic image because you can get shading and shadowing that you can't really get uh, in other types of painting. And... So it very, very quickly, oil on, oil on wood, oil on canvas, uh, it very, very quickly became a, <clears throat> excuse me, it became a, uh, the, the most highly sought after and collectible media in, in art and in painting because the level of realism was just so high. Now, it starts in the north and slowly spreads its way south to Europe. We don't see oil paint become as popular until a little bit later in Italy. Uh, early on in the early Renaissance in Italy, it'll still be fresco because they're following along with the Gothic. But in the north, uh, because this is where it, it starts, this, this becomes the, very quickly becomes the most prominent art form. Now, this is the altarpiece open, and we notice that each panel shows the religious figures, but they're depicted as uh, in the, the style of the time. And that's also kind of important here because this isn't looking backwards. In the early Renaissance, they want to they wanna try and take these religious figures, these traditional figures, and update them a little bit. So what we see here is uh, you know, Jesus on his throne in heaven, flanked by his mother Mary, and then... Um, he's he, he's depicted like a an early Renaissance king, and he's surrounded by angels and choirs and organs and you know those things that are would be typical in the, their mod, their contemporary society. Then the scene at, and panels at the bottom show the hierarchy here on Earth. It's a very orderly scene. We see a great deal of depth and perspective. We see. Uh, this atmospheric perspective of the bluing near the landscape and the horizon. We see the city of Ghent in the background. This is the Ghent altarpiece. It's in, in Ghent, Belgium. Um, we see uh, the rich and, and uh, variety of colors that no other uh, painting form of the time could give. Even fresco couldn't give the same level of color and richness of color as oil paint could. Now, after Van Eyck's uh, invention of oil paint um, spreads, what we see is that painting becomes a commodity. Fresco is painting on wet plaster, and as such, you can't really buy and sell fresco paintings unless you're going to buy and sell the house that the fresco is attached to. Uh, but paintings on wood, paintings on canvas, paintings that are... Um, that are mounted or framed, those can travel. Those can be bought and sold. Those can be shipped. Those can, can find their way into collections. And so the collector uh, can change out the image uh, in their, you know, on display in their home or in the church uh, at, at will, basically. And that really changes the way that we view art. Art is no longer going to just be uh, especially painting, no longer just going to be a way to decorate 
uh, permanently decorate a home. Now it's going to going to be able to be uh, changed out. We're going to see artists and collectors of painting change. Now, as we get close up, we see the level of detail that's available to uh, now that we, that artists are using oil paint. Prior to the invention of oil paint. These very, very fine details would have been difficult to get. It was, it was um, possible to get fine line, but the variation of color close up uh, and in that modeling in the light and dark, that was uh, almost impossible to get in tempera. Uh, tempera paint is, is opaque. It's not translucent. And so as such, if I put a, a, a darker shade, a darker value over lighter value, it's going to be opaque, and so I'm not going to see any of that lighter come through or the, and vice versa. And so by mixing the, the various levels of oil, I can get more and more translucent um, layering, and that allows some of the underpainting to come through. And that's what creates that luminescent quality. The, the, the oil paintings tend to have this value where they, they almost glow in the light, and that's what, what really makes them special. Now, Van Eyck's paintings um, are inspirational, not so much in the and innovational in their technique, but not so much in their subject matter. However, one way that um, that Van Eyck was a little bit uh, forward thinking and forward looking in terms of subject is the way that he depicts women. We see Mary depicted in both cases, on, in, in the Annunciation and seated on the throne next to Jesus, as holding a book and reading a book. And that shows her uh, as a woman of her time and not so much as a woman of um, the, the, the reality of Mary. Um, you know, she's, she's literate, she's reading scripture, she's studying, she's... Um, and. That's really, there's, you know, the depictions of women and the role of women in society are changing, and that's in, in the early Renaissance. And women are going to become a more important cultural force uh, in, that, in that time period. Now, this is Giovanni Arnolfini and his bride, and it should look familiar because uh, during the uh, in the earlier chapters, this is one of the works that was discussed in terms of symbolism. Van Eyck painted Arnolfini and his bride as a double portrait, portraits and secular, in particular secular portraits of figures who were not nobility, <clears throat> become an important art form and an important um, way for artists and role that artists play in society of the early Renaissance. It became a, a way to express wealth to have your portrait made, and the finer the portrait, and the finer and the higher the level of and fame and notoriety of the artist who paints your portrait, the you know that that meant that um, you had you were showing off your wealth, and so that's another way that artists' names become important because now who paints your portrait or whose paintings you collect. Um, become a part of your wealth. So if you can say, oh, well, this is my painting, this is my portrait that we had painted by Van Eyck or we had, you know, by, painted by this prominent artist, it's going to show off, it's another way for you to show off your wealth. Now, in terms of the symbolism of this painting, um, you know, if you remember and recall from the previous chapters, it talked about how every detail, and this is a, another key element of the early Renaissance, every detail is representative of not just what it is, but what it means. So the little dog represents fidelity. The, the clothing represents, shows off their wealth and their um, worldliness, because all of these details come not just from Belgium, but from all over the world. There's uh, the Spanish mirror, the, the silver uh, work from Central Europe that uh, in the chandelier, there's fruit from the Mediterranean. I mean, little things like that that seemingly kind of insignificant, but they really do matter in what they symbolize. Now, the other element here that's important is we're seeing the social changes of the relationship between men and women. So Arnolfini is a mid-level bureaucrat, and so this is his. This is a commemorative portrait 
of them celebrating the consummation of their marriage. So he, 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 the marriage wasn't seen as final or consummated until the bride became pregnant. Marriage was about a relationship to secure an heir. It was not necessarily about romance. They don't seem very happy, um, but it's really about providing an heir for Onofini to guarantee that his wealth will be passed on to the next generation. And the same, so we can see that she's pregnant, not only from her body form, but also from the veil. Every Veils were worn by pregnant women. Veils were not necessarily worn during the marriage ceremony, um, which that's what becomes tradition. But we see them in marriage portraits because that the, they would wear the veil when they were pregnant, and the pregnancy is what consummated the marriage. Now, individual portraits, what we would think of as sort of sentimental or keepsake portraits, also become important during the period. Roger van der Weyden, a contemporary of Van Eyck, uh, he's really known for his portraits. Um, portraits are very popular in the North. And this is, a, this is known as Portrait of a Lady. And this woman was most likely the mistress of a wealthy individual. She was probably not his wife um, because we don't know her name. What we do know is that she's pregnant, and it was not uncommon. In fact, it was quite common for wealthy men to not only have wives and have children by their wives, but very often to have keep mistresses. And those mistresses, um, it was another way to show off their wealth and their vitality and vigor. Um, but, all, but very often those mistresses would become pregnant as well. Now, the pregnancy, the, the, the wealthy individual would so support the, the mistress, um, keep her, uh, pay for her lodging, pay for her wealth, well-being. Um, and, per, and usually during their lifetime, they would support uh, and pay for their, um, the, the children of their mistress. But... It was not. Um, it was not by law allowed for them to inherit. So only the um, only the, the the offspring of the the official marriage could inherit any of the property of the um, of the wealthy man. She's. This is a portrait that would have been made for him to commemorate this. Um, that's And it's probably a mistress because he's not in it. So this isn't celebrating their wedding. It's really more of a keepsake to say, to commemorate um, that her pregnancy. And this would have been kept by him in his private study. Um, and it shows her being deferential. She's not looking at the viewer. She looks down in a way. Um, her hands are clasped. She's... Uh, She's being deferential because this is really made for him to be the viewer. Now, as there's more and more of this upper middle class, the wealthy class in Europe, rather than just the nobility, we're moving out of the feudal system and into capitalism. And as such, what's happening is that th these wealthy individuals, they want to... Um, they want to have uh, fine things and luxurious things and to express their wealth in their collections. And so decorative objects become uh, important and, the, and the collectible. And this is one such. The Limbourg brothers in France become famous for the series of decorative calendars. Now, the calendar was important um, because it was functional, it was also beautiful, but it was a, a useful object. Um, we tend to think about the calendar in, in small increments today. You know, we focus on days, minutes, hours. Um, but for them, you know, for the most part, they, they were, their calendar was really more seasonal, you know, before the rise of the, the business class. In terms of wealth... You know, that if your wealth is based upon land, 
and the wealth and the product of that land, then you're really thinking in terms of, you know, harvest, uh, you know, planting, uh, that, that's how you generate wealth and how you calculate your wealth. Uh, how many, you know, when is it time to, for the, the animals to give birth? When is it time for the animals to, to, to be slaughtered and be processed? Well, in, as, as things move into more capitalistic society, the, the wealth is going to be, be, be based upon business deals. And so your business deal is not going to be a seasonal thing. It's really going to be more uh, based upon, okay, a date, a month, a, you know, an increment of time. And so these calendars become important in that. And so, you know, they, these are wealthy individuals. They want them to be decorative. This isn't a single-use calendar like we think of. These are calendar pages that would be year to year, or used year to year. Um, and so this represents a month. This is January. And in January, they celebrate the feast of, uh, excuse me, they celebrate feast days. Um, we would think about Jan January in terms of the new year, January the 1st. But in their time, the big holiday uh, of January was was uh, was January the 8th. Um, and they celebrated um, with a big feast and um, that included their uh, jousting tournaments that you see in the background. That included everybody uh, getting uh, all dressed up in their finest. Um, it's, uh, it's also an important uh, religious holiday. So this is usually the, uh, uh, excuse me, around that day we celebrate the um, uh, th this was a, uh, a a nod to their pagan past um, the that we still kind of know about through like the twelve days of Christmas they they celebrated Saturnalia around the the turn of the uh, the twenty first which is the the shortest day of the year it's the the winter solstice and then. Twelve days later, we had Epiphany, which is the um, you know, in there celebrating the the, the midwinter festival the, and Christmas, um, and then the culminating with this big celebration, which was the New Year, and the, and so all of this in in this one scene. Now, for each month, they had a new scene relative to uh, the the what's happening at the time. So spring and planting, fall and harvesting, and then late in the year, the killing of the boar, which in December, in the build-up to Saturnalia was the Boar's Head Festival, which starts in the during this time period and um, is uh, was an important part of their their season in holiday. Okay, so the, the point is, is that um, these calendar pages were reproduced, they were hand painted and tinted, um, but they were uh, collectible. And so th this calendar would be reused every year um, it, and the, it could fit into a frame, it would be on display in a parlor, uh, and then you know the next year they'd bring it back out and it was a way for them to kind of know the season and mark the time but add decorative elements as well. Now, other printmakers, and the Limburgs printed and hand-painted their calendars, but other printmakers like Martin Schongauer, they were trying to reach a wider audience with their more uh, religious message. And Schongauer made a series of images of the saints and of religious scenes. Uh, these are etchings, so they are carved into, a, or etched into a, a metal plate, and then uh, the plate is inked and reproduced on paper multiple times. Uh, and each print could be um, then sold and collected. Um, and these were very popular with, with both because they could be collected by more than just those wealthy elite. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, they also allowed Schongauer to express his own religious beliefs. Um, and he's showing, this is St. Anthony tortured by demons. And so he's really being creative with what the demons look like and the forms they take. Um, and so, you know, that's what a way he's showing his own 
uh, his own style and creativity through the imagery. Now, in Italy, in the early Renaissance, um, it's we see a little bit of a different take. We don't see oil paint early on. That doesn't come until a little later. But we see the renewed classicism, a return to relief in carving, a uh, return to fresco or, or the continuation of the, the rise of fresco in the Gothic that we saw with Giotto. Uh, we also see a renewed interest in, in architecture as that will come through throughout the Renaissance. Now, early on in the, the early Renaissance, the city fathers of Florence, um, well, they held a competition to commission a new set of doors for the baptistry to the Florence Cathedral. And they wanted these doors to reflect this new attitude in early Renaissance culture and society towards the humanism. Um, humanism was a classical ideology focused on that man being the measure of all things and the individual relationship and decision that man makes to either follow the precepts of Christianity or not. And so they, they invited several artists to make panels, um, and then that competition, the winner of that competition, would then be chosen to, uh, co to create these doors. Now, this was a really big deal. These doors were going to be cast in bronze, very large-scale work, uh, be several years' work and commission of, of a very prominent, prominent place and structure in Florence. So this was a really big deal to get this commission. And it came down to two artists. It came down to uh, Lorenzo Ghiberti, uh, a sculptor and architect, and Filippo Brunelleschi, a, a very prominent um, Gothic, late Gothic, early Renaissance sculptor and architect. And Brunelleschi um, was a uh, he was really more known as an architect, although as a, an architect, you had to be able to do execute and design sculpture because the sculpture very often embellished the architecture. So they were given this commission or this, uh, they're invited to be part of this competition and they each chose, well, they, they were told to, as a subject that they had to do uh, the sacrifice of Isaac. Now, this is a religious story, of course, of the story of Abraham and being called by God as known as Abram uh, to out of Ur to be the creator of God's people. And, you know, Abraham, as a 90 year old, he and Sarah are, are uh, had never had children. And so God says that he will make from them all nations and they are blessed with a son that they name Isaac. Then. As Isaac gets older and comes of age, uh, Abraham is visited by an angel and says that God wants him to sacrifice Isaac, his son, to God. And so God takes, you know, decides, a Abraham decides to be faithful and takes Isaac uh, up on the mountain where he first was called by God. And he's going to, about to sacrifice him when the angel flies in and said, God has seen that you're faithful and you don't have to sacrifice Isaac. Now, the panel on the left was the panel created by Brunelleschi, and the panel on the right is the panel created by Ghiberti. Ultimately, the, the judges of the competition chose as the, the winner to be Ghiberti. And you'll notice that they both have a, a similar level of realism and style, similar, similar level of... Uh, dramatic movement, um, but the the major difference is that which figure is at the center. The figure at uh, really at the center of the work in Ghiberti's is Abraham, and the figure at the center of the work in Brunelleschi's is uh, is Isaac. Now that's a, an, a subtle but important difference because. Uh, in the early Renaissance, there's this focus on humanism that, and in the story, if you focus, in, you know, you're, as you interpret the story, if you focus on Isaac, then Isaac really is is not the main character. Isaac is the the, you know, he's sort of the sacrificial lamb figure or character in the story, whereas 
if you focus on Abraham, Abraham has is the one with the choice. And that's ultimately the message of the Renaissance in Italy, is that we all have an individual choice. And artists have a choice of expression. They can choose to express themselves artistically in, in whatever style, but also as they interpret the subject. So Ghiberti is chosen, and he's the one who gets the commission to create these doors. Now, these the doors ultimately are known as the Gates of Paradise, and they are very representative in each panel of the, the renewed classicism. We can see in the reliefs uh, very much a Roman-style relief, the various levels of relief. We see so the influence of the Gothic and of... Uh, of Giotto in these panels because of the backgrounds and the, the uh, architectural elements of the backgrounds. Um, and then the, the, they really do come to represent, and this style comes to represent uh, art in the early Renaissance in Italy. But the sculpted forms, like we've seen with Donatello, we previously talked about Donatello uh, and his view and his interpretation you know, that, that really does come to represent um, art of the early Renaissance, that the artist interprets, that the artist communicates, that the artist is the one who's making the decisions. And that's a, that was a, a radical shift and change in the way that we view art, because previous to this time period, the artists were just laborers, seen as laborers, who were executing the vision of either the church or the patron or the, the politics of the those uh, of that that time period. Now, other sculptors besides Donatello, who we've already talked about, are uh, became really important in showing this uh, the dramatic nature of the the and expressive nature of the time. This is by Antonio Pagliulo, and Pagliulo is uh, he becomes really famous for his very dramatic figures. He looks back at the, the works of, art, of artists like Myron and his Discobolos that we looked at in the Greek um, and the Hel other Hellenistic sculptures, and he sees these very expressive, very dramatic forms, and he wants to capture that in his work. And he also is unique in the, and special because he's the, for the first time we see not only a renewed classical style, but we see a return of classical subject matter. This is uh, Pagliulo's um, sculpture of uh, Hercules and Antaeus. So here we have the Greek uh, hero of Hercules and very classical not only uh, and but very and a very humanistic story. So Hercules is a, an important figure because he represents the success of man, that man can rise up and become this hero and become a demigod and through his efforts. And so, you know, this would have been a very uh, important subject matter for early Renaissance and representative of that early Renaissance because of what of who, you know, Hercules and what he was able to do. Now, in terms of painting, we see the uh, an important figure in Masaccio. Masaccio is credited with the invention of linear perspective. So if, there, if the innovation of the North and the important uh, um, discovery in the North is the development of oil paint, in Italy, it's the development of linear perspective. And it's when those two things are brought together, when linear perspective and oil paint come together, that we're really going to see uh, painting become the, the dominant art form in, in culture um, of the Renaissance. Now, the, what we see here is that linear perspective is about following the lines of a structure or uh, lines of a space to a vanishing point. And that vanishing point is on the horizon line, which is the, the line of our eye, basically. And it's where it's the line where the earth meets the sky. And so if the lines of perspective, if the vanishing point, if those follow um, 
they all go to that one point, then what we end up seeing is this a believable space. So here we have very often credited with being the first use of that perspective in a fresco painting. This is called the Trinity. We see Christ on the cross, and then above him uh, is the dove of the Holy Spirit, which kind of is that white form, kind of looks like actually God's collar almost, uh, and then God above, above that dove. And so those are the, the three parts of the Trinity, and the lines of the perspective of the vault they actually all flow to the base of the cross, and we see in the schematic on the right uh, how those how that perspective works. Now, when this was unveiled, we we actually have a story written by a contemporary uh, who was there at the unveiling, and he said it was if the it was as if Masaccio had blown open the wall and created this fantastic space. And, and that actually is really what perspective is all about. It's about creating a believable system of three dimensions on a two-dimensional surface. Artists had, had experimented and had tried to create this system, but it's really Masaccio who gives us this first um, actual method to use it and to do it. And that's what is going to change art uh, and painting from here forward. Now Masaccio, not only does he create this, but he also uses it to great effect. And so one of the other important developments that Masaccio uh, does, gives us, is this believable space, this believable landscape that the perspective says that you don't have to completely uh, incorporate every part of, uh, a, a, of that space in the picture plane. So the elements, the buildings can go off the plane, they can go outside the frame, and that that still be believable. In fact, it's more believable, it's more realistic. And when you have a group of figures and they overlap, that, that they, you know, he learns from Giotto that they don't all have to face the frame, that they can, you know, that they'll overlap and face different directions. Um, and we see all of that come, come into play in the early Renaissance. Now, other artists in the time are experimenting with that, that uh, perspective, and they don't always get it right, um, but they're, they're being creative, and that's what's important. So here, uh, Filippo Lippi is a very important figure in the early Renaissance because he, um, he shows the mysticism. He shows the, uh, the, that creativity in um, in his nativity. So he's imagining this scene. This isn't a scene from uh, from any kind of scriptural reference. You know, he's he's saying, well, he he thinks about okay, if after the the shepherds, after the you know the shepherds viewed the Mary and the baby, and then they went back and they told others about what they had seen what well, what would happen next you know what there's no next part of the story but in what he view he imagines is okay well what would what would that look like so they would have gone back and told everybody who all these people who were looking for a messiah would then have come to view for themselves so the local religious leaders would have come and they would have inspected the baby and then that would have brought out all the other people who just wanted to see and witness and and they you know they wanted to see for themselves but he places it in his own time period so lippy doesn't put it back into uh you know what the first century he brings it forward to the uh, to his time, to the early Renaissance, and it it's, would have happened, you know, he, he's imagining what all that would have looked like. Now, Lippi becomes famous, and this is really typical of early Renaissance, you become famous for one form or another, and so th he becomes sort of famous for his nativities, his Madonnas and Child, uh, and, and this round shape to the canvas become, or to the panel, that becomes quite common, the uh, these shaped canvases. That was something else from the Gothic that carries forward to the Renaissance. The last of the early Renaissance painters we're going to look at is Botticelli. 
Botticelli becomes famous um, and and really because of his sort of radical approach to subject matter and his monumental paintings. Um, Botticelli became uh, he he came really close to being excommunicated because he the church uh, he's he's a, a Roman painter he's a, an, a, a right at the heart of the Catholic Church and they wanted him to express Catholic ideals and he he really refused he wanted to make. Uh, paintings of, inspired by Greek mythology, by the Greek stories that he had read and studied, uh, and and he he really didn't give the the church what they wanted, and so as such, he came close to to offending the Pope. Now, this is his Primavera. It's one of his more famous works. Um, these are all. This is actually a monumental work. Um, these these figures are larger than life size. It's a huge, huge painting. And they show at the center there is uh, Mother Nature, and then the, the Three Graces, the image of male and female youth and beauty, uh, that the, the figure with the flowery dress is actually an allegorical figure of the flowering of spring, the budding of spring. The blue figure there is the wind. Cupid at the top shooting his arrow at the male figure. Uh, of beauty on the left, and this is all about spring and the glorious flowering and budding of spring and fertility. Now, the the point here is that Botticelli is choosing to make an image, an allegorical image, but an image that that really represents the Renaissance. He saw the Renaissance as a springing forth of ideas, and he saw the change that was happening in society as an awakening, as an opening as a, a the, the fertility of man's creativity. And he the, really artists of their time were were exploring these things at a time when the church really didn't want them to. They, they, they wanted to try and control subject matter like they had. And that was unacceptable. Botticelli chooses to do what he wants to images of beauty that he sees. This is his Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty. And she's not, um, you know, the typical classical view of beauty. She's what Botticelli sees as beautiful. And so she's, um, you know, by painting these at all, ultimately, um, Botticelli is saying that he, you know, he's going to make paintings that he sees beautiful, images that he sees beautiful, um, and that it's not going to be about religious subject matter. It's not going to be about, um, about what the church wants. It's going to be what he wants. And that the artist is at the center of that decision-making. And, and that's a radical change and shift. That man is at the center. That's classicism. Not, not a collective, not a group, but us individually. And that's classicism. And that's the that's really what's being reborn in the Renaissance, and we're going to see that come to fruition in the next generation of the High Renaissance in Italy that we'll talk about in the next video. All right, so look for that next video soon.